the monkery as as he called it um again one wonders like what kind of spiritual direction he was getting in all of this i mean well, maybe he was just getting terrible terrible advice like was somebody saying well the reason that it's not working for you is because you need to fast for five days instead of four like you know i mean this this just seems like he was just in yeah. In a bad headspace and getting bad advice if this is the course of action because this is not <laughs> well actually this is not actually, the way that they that monasteries are meant to operate. Actually, we're gonna find out in a moment, Matt, that his spiritual director did try. Well, hello, and welcome to another real and true episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken. I'm Matt Swaim, along with my colleague Ken Hensley. We're with the Coming Home Network. You can find us online at chnetwork.org. Tons and tons of resources there. Almost everything is completely free, including our online community full of people who are asking all kinds of questions about Catholicism. And you can find that community.chnetwork.org. Dot org. You can click the donate button while you're there too and support what we do. Ken, we're talking about your friend and mine, Martin Luther. And I guess this is, if this were like a, a, a television show, um, this is the part of the beginning of the episode where we'd say previously on On the Journey. <laughs> yeah, we're doing a, we're doing a series on the life, uh, some of the life and the, some of the most important teachings of Martin Luther. And we began the series last week. Last week, we looked at Luther's life up to his entering the Augustinian monastery. In fact, it was the strictest sect of the Augustinians in Germany at the time. This is in 1505. And we closed last week's episode by asking the question, why? That is, why did Luther so suddenly leave the path that his parents had mapped out for him and that he was in that he was walking at the time at the University of Erfurt, why did he so suddenly leave that path to become a monk? Um, there was the storm, of course, the famous storm, you know, where the, the clouds darkened and he fell to the earth and he cried out, St. Anne, help me, I will become a monk. Uh, but we noticed last week that Luther, later on in his life, he spoke specifically of his motivation for becoming a monk and when he did, these are the sorts of things that he said. I'm quoting Luther now. My mother caned me for stealing a nut until the blood came. Such strict discipline drove me to the monastery, although she meant well. And then another quotation from Luther. My father once whipped me so that I ran away and felt ugly toward him till he was at pains to win me back. The serious and austere life that they led with me caused me to enter a monastery and become a monk. So it, several times he made these kinds of comments. In fact, looking back, he said at one point that his parents' severity with him as a boy had, quote, shattered my nervous system, unquote. So this was involved in his motivation for becoming a monk, and I think that we'll, we'll be unfolding this a bit more as we move forward. So Luther becomes a monk in 1505. Two years later, he's ordained into the priesthood at the Cathedral Church of St. Mary in Erfurt. He had postponed his, um, the celebration of his first Mass, specifically so that his father, who he hadn't seen since entering the monastery two years before, so that his father could be there. And um, Hans did not disappoint. It, it, at least initially, he didn't disappoint. He arrived with 20 horsemen, and he brought with him a generous gift for the monastery. So this is Luther's first Mass. Now, this is Luther telling the story, by the way. After the Mass, Luther sat down to share a meal with his father and with the other guests that were there for his first Mass. As they began to eat, apparently Luther looked across the table at his father, and he said, and I'm quoting him now, Dear Father, why were you so contrary to me becoming a monk? Perhaps you are still not satisfied. The life is so quiet and godly. Young Martin was not prepared for what was to come, Matt. In front of his fellow monks, in front of all of his guests, this is what Hans said to him. 
I must sit here and eat and drink when I would much rather be somewhere else. You learned scholar, have you never read in the Bible that you should honor your father and your mother? And here you have left me and your dear mother to look after ourselves in our old age. Now, it sounds a little bit strange to me, you know, right away. He rides up with 20 horsemen. He brings a generous gift. And then what he's worried about is that his son is not going to become a rich attorney, which was the plan, and support him in his old age. But so maybe he was greedy or maybe uh, maybe even though he could bring a generous gift, maybe he did, did not have Social Security at the time or something like that. He still needed help. But anyway, this is what Hans says to his son. Luther responded like this. But Father, I could do more good by prayers than if I had stayed in the world. He went on to remind his dad of the call that he had received, the call that he believed had come from God that day in the storm. St. Anne, help me, I will become a monk and all that. But his father cut in before he could even finish. God grant that it was not an apparition of the devil. So, so uh, this, just to, yeah. this is something that will come up later when Luther is trying to understand that thing that happened to him in the storm. And down the road, Luther will echo this kind of thing. But man, can you imagine? You've just come into your own yeah. in your vocation. You've just yeah. somewhat arrived. I mean, and you, you've seen shows where this has happened, mm -hmm. where someone finally like gets to the pinnacle of what they've been working so mm -hmm. hard to get to, and someone comes in and just pops the bubble. I mean, and not just someone, yeah. but the guy's dad. I mean, this... Yeah. It's, it, I mean, you can have all kind of cynical ideas about like w the conclusions Luther drew, mm -hmm. but you can't help but feel for a person who has given everything to his vocation, tried to follow God, and then in this most important moment, mm -hmm. just gets, it's what a punch in the gut. Yeah, there's no doubt. I, I, I think devastating is the word that comes to my mind. From what we know of Luther so far, Again, he describes himself as, ha as his, his, his nervous system having been shattered. He goes into the monastery. He's ordained into the priesthood and for his father to come and say these sorts of things. And, and we know from other things that Luther wrote later in life, we know that he always felt terrible for having disappointed his parents. You know, Hans and Margareta, they wanted him to get a great education, and they took pains to make sure that he would, sending him to the Latin school, making sure that he got into one of the finest universities in Germany, the University of Erfurt. And um, he's on this path to become an attorney, to do well for himself, and to also be in a position to take care of them in their old age. And suddenly this. Anyway, it's clear from later things that he said, Matt, that he always felt terrible that he had been a great disappointment to his parents. Uh, it was clear that he loved his father. And when he learned of his father's death some 25 years after this point, um, he shut himself away with the book of Psalms and he wept for hours. We have a letter that he wrote to his partner, Philip Melanchthon, at the time in which he wrote this, quoting, My dear Philip, I have just heard that my father has died. Through him, God gave me life. Through his sweat, he raised me. I am too beaten to write anymore. So Luther loved his mother. Luther loved his father. But it's clear that he struggled his entire life with the feeling that as a son, he had been one tremendous disappointment. Okay? And here's the thing. It's very clear. It seems to me that this struggle is something that he brought with him into the monastery and into his relationship with God. Although he gave himself to the monastic life, it appear, uh, from, from his own statements, I'm not psychologizing here, he could not find peace in his relationship with God. By every account, Luther was a tormented soul. He was a man whose vision of God was the vision of a father that was impossible to please, a father that no matter how hard he tried, he could not please. And uh, apparently he tried. In the monastery, we are told that Luther would fast for days without a crumb of food, um, in the freezing German winter, he would take his blankets and throw them off the bed and just freeze himself as a discipline, as an ascetic discipline. Uh, he kept more vigils than were required and longer vigils, all in hopes that God would be pleased with him. This is what Luther. This is how Luther described his experience as a monk. I was a good monk. I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear this out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself 
with vigils, prayers, reading, and other works. But apparently, no matter what Father Martin did, the questions just kept coming at him. His conscience, have you done enough? Have you fasted enough? Have you kept enough vigils? Is God pleased with you? Does God accept you? And the answer in every case was no. For Luther, God was an angry, impossible to please father. And as a son, uh, well, well, he was a worthless uh, disappointment. That's how he viewed it himself. Yes. Yeah, so um, we have a, a couple of books. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to read either one of them. Um, Father Boniface Hicks, who was an atheist, who's now a Benedictine monk, mm-hmm. um, has written a couple of books on prayer and spiritual direction. And um, we've been doing a series with him on the the radio show that I do, the Sunrise Morning Show. And it's been amazing mm-hmm. just to hear as we unpack um, his thoughts and his process of going through spiritual direction mm-hmm. and just how important it is to kind of have a second set of eyes and a wise set of eyes on your spiritual life. Uh, when it comes to these kinds of things. Uh, I mean, with the benefit of having talked to a guy who does spiritual director for a, mm-hmm. direction for a living with, like Father Boniface, I can just think of like you know, how you just want to like jump into this situation and say, man, I wish you could just, in this pain, have talked to somebody who said, Luther, it's not about freezing to death. Luther, it's not about yeah. all this stuff that you're, the monkery, as, as he called it. Um, Again, one wonders like what kind of spiritual direction he was getting in all of this. I mean, well, maybe he was just getting terrible, terrible advice. Like was somebody saying, well, the reason that it's not working for you is because you need to fast for five days instead of four. Like, you know, I mean, this this just seems like he was just in, in yeah. a bad head space and getting bad advice if this is the course of action, because this is not. <laughs> well, actually, this is actually, not the way that, they, that monasteries are meant to operate. Actually, we're going to find out in a moment, Matt, that his spiritual director did try but, but I wanted to mention something else first. We'll get to that in just a second. And that is the traditional Protestant response to Luther's struggles. Okay? It, it, it goes something like this. And this is the way I, I always thought of it. This is the way I heard and was taught and the way I thought of it. It goes something like this. If the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, it, excuse me, it is the Roman Catholic Church that made Luther the tormented soul that he was. Okay? After all. This, this is the way I was told. After all, I mean, doesn't Catholicism, Matt, doesn't it teach us to view God as an impossible-to-please angry father? Um, doesn't the Catholic Church encourage us to think of our lives as lives of desperate striving, working in hopes of meriting eternal life? If Luther was a troubled soul, um, it, it's only because he was a sensitive enough man to take the teachings of the evil Catholic Church seriously and discover that it was impossible for him to earn his way to heaven. If Luther lived in dread of the judgment of God, it's only because the church taught him to live in dread. You know, I don't know if in the Methodist church it was that way, but I remember hearing that basic kind of attitude, okay? That was the impression that, I got when I read Here I Stand from from Bainton, right? That was certainly the impression I got. Yeah. But of course, you know, now yeah. uh, with the benefit of having, you know, been Catholic for 17 years now and having seen like Mm -hmm. who it is from those centuries leading up to luther that the church considers saints um yeah and seeing that there's a kind Mm -hmm. of a radiance and a joy and a lightness to them and yes there's some strict observances in the mix there but like man like yeah see this is the one wonders if 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 instead of falling (laughs) with the strict augustinians in 1570 or 1505 Luther had fallen in with the joyful Franciscans about a century and a half earlier. You know, wonders like what his perspective might have been on this stuff. You're right, though, that reading Roland Bainton, and he does emphasize some of the artwork. I remember he emphasizes some of the woodcuts that existed at the time that showed Jesus sitting upon his throne, ruler of the world, you know, and, uh, you know, souls falling into hell and things like that. So it's true that he may have experienced some of these influences, but it's also... I think it's also pretty obvious that he had some demons of his own. And Catholics listening to this, that is to my description of the the traditional Protestant understanding or interpretation of Luther's struggles, Catholics listening are going to be thinking, but that's not what we believe as Catholics. I mean, we believe that salvation is God's gracious gift to us. 
um, from a God who said, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, we must cooperate with God's grace. And yes, we must take up our cross and walk in discipleship. But it's not the way Luther saw it. And when you think about it, if Catholicism actually taught, even at the time of Luther, if the Catholic Church actually taught what many Protestants think that it taught or think that it teaches, how are we to explain, you make a good point, how are we to explain those saints of the early medieval period, the late medieval period, the entire history of the church, who apparently have not struggled um, with their vision of God in the same way that Luther did? I think of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. I've read his treatise a couple of times on the love of God. I think of his hymns. In fact, I chose St. Bernard of Clairvaux to be my com- my uh, uh, confirmation saint, Matt, because as a Protestant, I led worship for years, and some of the hymns that were attributed to him I thought were some of the most beautiful. For instance, Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, thou light of men, from the best bliss that earth imparts, we turn unfilled to thee again. It surely doesn't seem like Bernard thought of God as his angry, impossible to please. Another saint that I loved was St. Philip Nero, St. Philip Neri, who was a contemporary of Luther, in fact. He was known for being continuously happy, just cracking jokes, playing pranks on all the young, you know, all of his young disciples around Rome. Um, he was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And then you mentioned St. Francis, St. Clair, there's St. Thomas Aquinas. What about St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila? My point is, apparently not everyone viewed God as Luther did. And if Catholicism actually taught what many Protestants think that it teaches, how are we to explain the fact that Luther's own confessor, and this is where I get to the point that you were raising a moment ago, Johann von Staupitz, who was the vicar general of the Augustinian order in Germany at the time, was Luther's good friend and Luther's personal mentor and confessor, Staupitz seems to have been baffled by Luther's inability to see God as a loving father. And it appears that he did everything that he could do to try and straighten Luther out in this way. On one occasion, it's reported, it was reported by Luther, that he said to him, man, God is not angry with you. This is Staupitz said to Luther, man, God is not angry with you. It is you who are angry with God. Don't you know that God commands you to hope? And is it just bottom line? I just go ahead and state it now. Luther was angry with God. And later in life, he said so, specifically, explicitly. Here's something Luther said, looking back on his life as a Catholic. I was more than once driven to the very abyss of despair so that I wished I had never been created. Love God, I hated him. All this to say, clearly, Luther had some issues of his own we can say related to his family, related to his father, related to his own psychological nature. Um, I don't know. But Luther had issues of his own, and he brought them into the monastery. Yeah, okay. and again, I, I really do think that's an important thing mm-hmm. to, to draw that contrast with what Luther was seeing and what the uh, you know some of the saints that you mentioned were seeing, because it it is kind of the way that grace operates and the mm-hmm. way that we're wired you know, how is it that we all walk into the same church service on a Sunday and all walk out and some of us have been struck by a thunderbolt from God and others Mm -hmm. of us were nodding off the whole time? Like, how? what's the mystery of that? That's a mystery that it's hard to... And then, you know, two Sundays later, the people who were struck by a thunderbolt two weeks before are nodding off and the ones who were nodding off are suddenly like overwhelmed by right right you know a moment of grace i mean there's a there's a mystery to 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 all of that um Mm -hmm. and again it's it's a hard thing to think about like you know how to how in the the mystery of god's providence does does that interplay between our receptivity and the and the way that we're wired you know work you know i'm I'm glad you brought up philip neary because philip neary is is a guy who's you know in a place where you know, one might think with the whole world in upheaval, he might not be this joyful kind of fun guy. I mean, Neri is, and and you see the same thing with Francis de Sales, uh, not Mm -hmm. long after Luther blows everything up. These are guys who would be, would have every single reason to be 
of the kind of mindset and disposition that Luther was, given the circumstances, but end up being some of the more kind of joyful writers of the faith. As a matter of fact, uh, and you may remember this, but last year I had grown a very large beard, and some of our viewers of On the Journey remember that I had a very large beard. But on the Feast of St. Philip Neri, I did something that St. Philip Neri himself did once, and that is I shaved half of the beard off and came to work. <laughs> I don't know if you were at the staff I remember that. that day. Yeah, that was one of his pranks. That was one of his pranks. So, but again, it, it, yes, it's, it's, it's to this to this mystery of like, how is it that, I mean, Luther and mm -hmm. Neri can be looking at the same kind of stuff and walking away with such kind of such different dispositions in regard to it. And, and this is where the human element really, mm -hmm. you know, kind of comes into play. Yeah, how can Johann von Staupitz I mean, he's the vicar general of the Augustinian order, and he's saying, God loves you. You know, it, it's not that God is angry with you. It's something in you, Luther. You're angry with God. And Luther's saying, yeah, that's right. I hate God. Yeah. Well, okay, and it got worse for Luther, and it got worse with respect to his conception of the church, Matt, because five years later in 1510, Another lightning bolt strikes in Luther's life. He had the great privilege of traveling to Rome with another Augustinian friar on, on a, on a business of some sort from the, from the order. And Martin, still a young man at the time, I mean, he was thrilled. He was thrilled, not merely because he had never been out of Germany, and yet that's the fact. He had never traveled outside Germany. He was thrilled because of the spiritual benefits that he thought would accrue to him by being able to go to that that place. He was daydreaming, you know, as I did before I went to Rome, and I've only been there, well, been there one time on pilgrimage, but he was thrilled at the thought of being able to walk the streets that the great saints Peter and Paul had walked, thrilled at the idea of being able to celebrate Mass in the great churches of Rome, just thrilled he would see these holy relics, of saints and martyrs, and with all this in mind, he sets off for the eternal city, and this was to be a turning point in Luther's life, and let me hit it off by reading to you the account from Heiko Obermann's uh, Luther scholar, a wonderful uh, scholarly um, biography titled Luther, Man Between God and the Devil. This is how Heiko Obermann describes it, the situation. Luther was certain that he would be able to find salvation in abundance in the center of Christendom and was thus determined to make the unique opportunities being afforded everywhere. But noticing how much blasphemous behavior went on in the holy city disturbed him deeply. Later he remembered clearly the shock and horror he had felt in Rome upon hearing for the first time in his life flagrant blasphemies being uttered in public. Sounds like he's walking around New York or L.A. He was deeply shocked by the casual mockery of saints and everything he held sacred. He could not laugh when he heard priests joking about the sacrament of the Eucharist. In Erfurt, his first Mass had set him shivering in awe. Now he had to stand by while servants of God thought it funny to blaspheme the most sacred words of institution. And then he's, he's quoting what they would say. Bread thou art and bread thou shalt remain. Wine thou art, and wine thou shalt remain. I was a serious and pious young monk, Luther says, who was pained by such words. Now, so here's the basic story of Luther going to Rome in 1510. And it's one of the points in the story where I think that we have to be open as Catholics, because this is where Catholics might become suspicious that, you know, the level of sin and decadence and evil in Rome is being exaggerated. You know, Luther's looking back on this situation. He's wanting to exaggerate the evils of Rome. And it, it may be that Luther is exaggerating some of the evils that he experienced. But I think that it's best for us to simply accept the fact, Matt, that at the time, Rome was known to be debaucherous and that the Vatican and the Vatican leadership all the way up was known to be in desperate need of spiritual reform. And Catholic writers at the time confirmed this again and again. I want to quote a couple so that those listening will see. For instance, the humanist priest Erasmus, he spoke of his own experiences in Rome like this. With my own ears, I heard the most loathsome blasphemies against Christ and his apostles. 
many acquaintances of mine have heard priests of the Curia, priests of the Vatican, uttering disgusting words so loudly, even during Mass, that all around them could hear it. Have you ever heard anything like that in Mass? You know, we talk about how bad it is in some, some parishes now, but have you ever heard in Mass, I'm asking you, Matt, have you heard disgusting words being uttered even during Mass by the priests so loudly that everyone around could hear them? I have not during Mass, but I <laughs> am not shocked at all by the stuff that, you know, I'm not, I'm not one who believes that Luther was exaggerating or Erasmus was exaggerating because I've been covering church right. news in various capacities for a decade mm. and a half, and to me this seems sort of mild <laughs> compared to some of the stuff that I had to cover, um, yeah. you know, in the past, you know, 15 mm-hmm. years. It's, I, I, it's, it's no surprise, actually. As a matter of fact, um, what's surprising to me is that Luther didn't have more detailed and graphic experiences to relate to us that Erasmus didn't have more detailed and graphic and more awful things to say. I mean, it's, these things do not, do not surprise me at all. Um, and, well, at least they don't appear you can zero in on this era of church history mm-hmm. and, and get to that stuff and, and yeah. find the horribleness of it. But you don't have to, you don't have to stick just to that generation or to the generation we're in now. If you want yeah. to find horrible, horrible things being done by clerics of the church. Yeah, and maybe, obviously there was more, but in these particular quotations, this is what we have. But listen to St. Ignatius of Loyola. He's the founder of the Jesuits. Um, Well, I don't have a quotation, but I have something that he advised. He advised good Catholics against going to Rome lest they be corrupted. And so try to just imagine quickly John Paul II, imagine Benedict XVI, imagine Pope Francis saying to people, whatever you do, Unless you want to be corrupted, unless you want your faith to be destroyed, stay away from Rome. No pilgrimages to Rome, okay? So it must have been pretty bad. And I don't think there's any reason to doubt that Luther's report is what was substantially true or that Luther's experience was substantially true. In fact, Catholic historian Hilaire Belloc has written these words. And as as you know, Hilaire Belloc is a very orthodox, very conservative, if you will, Catholic Um, who would want to protect the church and the good name of the church. This is what he says about the church at that time. I'm quoting, No one can deny that the evils provoking reform in the church were deep-rooted and widespread. They threatened the very life of Christendom itself. All who thought at all about what was going on around them realized how perilous things were and how great was the need of reform. Every kind of man would violently attack such monstrous abuses. It was from all this that the turmoil sprang. That is the turmoil of the Reformation he's referring to. And as it increased in violence, threatened to destroy the Christian church itself. So what this led to, we're still talking about Luther and Rome, was a crisis of confidence in the authority of the church. And I just need to, you know, bring this into the present again because I think about the people who come to us at the Coming Home Network and many Protestant pastors come to us and it's a recurring theme that they have begun to read, they've begun to study, maybe they've been studying a long time and they're beginning to fall in love with the truth and beauty of the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church, and yet they look around And they see, you know, this bishop doing that, you know, the other one doing this. You've got bishops in Germany. They're coming flat out and just saying the church is wrong on this or that. You know, they look around and they see these things. And so I can relate to it. And many of them do have a crisis of conscience in a way where they ask me, they ask me, look, I believe the Catholic Church to be what it claims to be. But, oh, man, how do you explain? And, of course, the explanation is the sinfulness of the human heart. Um, the ability yeah. of any we, one of us, I would say. The flip side of that, too, is, you know, to what level are we trying to do uh, what, <laughs> you know, Ignatius of Loyola was doing, which is saying, just don't pay any attention to Rome right now. As a matter of fact, this is another thing that we sometimes deal with, even in the online community, mm-hmm. is people want to post and get people's takes on various controversies going on in the church. And we sometimes have to say, hey, let's keep that out of this conversation for now, because all you're going to do is confuse a whole bunch of people and have them have people who are trying to understand does mm-hmm. you know the church's take on justification line up with the scriptures 
And now the waters are getting muddy because they're trying to figure out whether or not their own bishop sometimes um, is yeah. complicit in some sort of like a yeah. you know heresy or a cover up, right? And so I mean, it could be a right, very. Right. I mean, there's there's no way to to possibly overstate the kind of damage that this can do to someone um, who is trying to grow in faith and trying to be a. a a good son or daughter of the church when they see the people mm-hmm. who are supposed to be leading them in this falling down on the job and sometimes doing so and not caring right, sometimes the right. apathy. And that's, I think, you know, to me, that's the, that's the, the biggest gut punch in what Luther was seeing was not that people were sinning. I can handle sinners, right? But the people who are mm-hmm. essentially his bosses on up the chain are treating the blessed sacrament as though it's not even, important or it's not even real i mean bread that's, thou art and bread thou shalt remain i mean it would take yeah. a whole lot for for me to not just jump up and say <laughs> you say something in the moment if that saw that go, going on at mass you know it's it's yeah 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 one can okay, empathize well, the, with the frustration this culminated for luther in a particular event at the Church of St. John Lateran, there are, there's something called pilot stairs. And what it is is a set of stone stairs that were moved to Rome from Jerusalem and are believed to be the very steps that Jesus would have ascended um, when he met face-to-face with Pilate and when he was condemned, called pilot stairs. Well, Luther was climbing pilot stairs, and I've climbed those stairs as well. You go up the stairs one step, after another, on your knees. Luther, this is 500 years ago, but the stairs were there at the time. Luther was ascending these steps. This is his report. Going on his knees, step by step, kissing each step as he went, praying an Our Father at each step, attempting to believe that what he was doing was assisting those in purgatory, attempting to deal with what he had seen in, in his trip to Rome, which lasted a month, by the way all that he had seen and the struggles he was having, being a young monk who came there so excited, all of that. Anyway, his report is that as he reached the top of the stairs, doubts overcame him, and the thought came into his mind, who knows if it is really true? That's what he said. Yeah. Who knows if it's true? As, you know, an echo, of, uh, an echo of Pilate, you know, who, when Jesus oh, stood yeah, before what him, is said, truth? you know, what is truth? What is truth? Man. You know, and, and this can happen. You know, I mean, I don't want to get off the train on this, but y- you know, one of the most powerful motivations that some people have for being atheists is the evil that they see in the world and, uh, and the, the pain that they see in the world. Well, Luther went to Rome, and I can fully imagine it. He's like a young mis- a seminarian, as it were. I mean, he's a priest at the time, but he's just filled with joy. He gets to travel outside Germany. He gets to go to the Eternal City. He gets to experience all of these treasures of the Catholic faith. And his experience there is to culminate with, who knows? Who knows if it's true? Okay, so Luther returns to the monastery. He's still struggling. And now for the first time really in his entire life, he is wondering whether the church has the answer. He's doubting the church. And soon soon after this, in, in the garden of the monastery, um, the tradition is under a pear tree in the garden of the monastery, Johann von Staupitz informed Luther that he wanted him to begin to study for his doctor's degree in sacred scripture and prepare to assume the chair of biblical theology at the University of Wittenberg. This is a turning point in Luther's life as well. As Roland Bainton tells the story, um, Luther, quote now, stammered out 15 reasons why he could do nothing of the sort. The long and short of it was that so much work would kill him. That's what Luther thought. To this, Staupitz famously replied, quite right, God has plenty of work for clever men to do in heaven. Apparently, this is what Staupitz had in mind, being his confessor, being his spiritual director, He hoped that for Luther, who was obviously extraordinarily bright, he hoped that pouring himself into the study of sacred scripture might be something that could deliver him from his depression and from his continual anxiety. And so, in 1513, having received his doctorate, 
he spent several years studying, Luther began lecturing at the University of Wittenberg. And this is what we're going to come to next week, but I'll summarize here just quickly. Between 1513 and 1517, he lectured through the Psalms, as well as St. Paul's letter to the Romans and St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It was during these years that Luther came studying the Psalms, and we'll go into detail on this, and studying Romans in particular, Romans chapter 1 especially to begin with, that Luther came to a view of justification. He came to a view of the doctrine of justification, that is, how one is made right in the sight of God, a view that had never been taught in the history of Christian theology, but a view of justification that delivered Luther completely from the fear and the anxiety that he had of standing before a God that was angry all the time and that he could never please. Um, this discovery, in fact, of, a, of his doctrine of justification by faith alone is the way that it's described. This, this changed his life forever, and this is what led to his eventual break with the Catholic Church. And sorry to tell you, but cliffhanger, this is where we're going to pick up next week with Luther studying, uh, studying the Psalms and Luther studying Romans and coming to his new view of the doctrine of justification, a view that has, that to this day is the classic Reformation view of the doctrine of justification, how we're made right in the sight of God, that led to, well, it's the primary doctrinal issue that led to his break with Rome and the division between Catholicism and Protestantism. And you're right to call it a, a new one because it's not one that has, I mean, he was able to find stuff in Scripture to argue his case. He was even to, able to point yep. to St. Augustine, right, to argue his case. Uh, but overall, as Reformation historians have said, um, that this particular view that he ended up articulating was one that had never been articulated um, yeah, in fact, Protestant, so. Protestant scholar Alistair McGrath, um, an Oxford scholar and a Protestant, he has stated categorically that Luther's view was a theological novum, he calls it. He says it had never been taught. He says it had never been, and I'm quoting him, contemplated, unquote, in 1500 years of Christian thought. But anyway, we'll come to that next week. Yeah, and uh, again, we don't even want to start on that. Uh, this late in an episode, it deserves its, you know, own entire thing to to really dig into. But in the meantime, um, hopefully, people who have been uh, lifelong admirers of Luther can see in this, you know, kind of how the pieces have fit together. Hopefully, some Catholics who are watching this who have been lifelong, I guess, haters on Luther can maybe see the picture come together as to why someone might come to the conclusions they came to and hopefully in the course of all of it, all of it we get a better understanding of of what god actually wants for you know his people uh so if this is something that has uh, been on your mind uh, i know that we get a million questions about justification i know that you're a favorite ken when someone asks you questions about justification and the and the nuts and bolts of it because that means that there's uh 25 more paragraphs that have to come out of you in response but uh, you can always get in touch with us <laughs> through the coming home network it's a lot easier if you come visit us in the online community which is community.chnetwork.org so you can talk with a bunch of people who have wrestled with this kind of thing before and get their own sort of uh takes on on how they worked it out and of course if you want to support our work you can always go to chnetwork.org and then click on that button at the top that says donate to uh, help keep the light bulbs on. So, Ken Hensley, thank you again. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Matt. We'll see you next week. <laughs>